Hi everyone, I'm Jonathan Amsterdam. I'm on the Go team at Google working on the package.go.dev site, and I had a hand in the design of the error wrapping support that we added to the standard library in Go 113, and that's the topic of my talk today. The idea of error wrapping is that one error can contain another, forming what we'd like to call the error chain. An error chain is a linked list of errors. Each error in the chain adds some information to the original error, the one at the end of the chain. This is more than just concatenating the error messages into a string. With wrapping, you can get the concatenated string, but you also hold on to the errors themselves, so programs can inspect them. Go 113 introduced support for error wrapping to the standard library. In keeping with Go's design philosophy, the support we added was pretty minimal. Three new functions in the errors package, and a new formatting verb for fump.errorref. And we weren't trying to break new ground. Many Go developers were already wrapping errors. We just felt it was time to codify this pattern in the standard library, so everyone's error wrapping code looked more or less the same. To understand why error wrapping is useful, it's helpful to keep in mind that errors have two audiences, people and programs. People use errors to diagnose and debug problems. Programs act on errors in a variety of ways. Depending on the nature of the error, a program might retry an operation or try an alternative action. Or if it can't proceed, it might at least try to help people understand the error better by adding information to it. Error wrapping helps programs by giving them more information to use for their decisions. Let's look at an example to see how that works. After that, I'll discuss how wrapping works in detail. Then I'll give some tips on using wrapping effectively. And lastly, I'll talk about some error features that didn't make it into Go 113 and how you can write your own versions of those features. Our story starts with a struct that might be used to configure a program. We're going to read the config out of a file so the program can use it. Our read config function opens the file, then uses the encoding JSON package to decode its contents. If there's an error reading or decoding, we return it. Here's a function that reads the config and displays it on the screen. If there's an error, it calls explain error, which is intended to give the user more information about the problem so they can take some sort of corrective action. And here's explain error. It inspects its argument and uses the information it gathers to help the user. This particular function is a bit silly, but you can imagine real world versions of it that genuinely add value. Silly or not, explain error uses the same three methods for inspecting errors that nearly all Go code does. First, it compares the error to known values, which we call sentinel errors. One of those sentinel errors is the IO package's error unexpected EOF. Second, it looks at the type of the error. The type itself encodes information, and once we have a value of that type, we can look inside it. Third, it calls a predicate function, a function that categorizes the error. Now let's return to our read config function and try to improve it by adding some extra information to the error it returns. We do this with the best of intentions. We're just trying to help our users. But we've completely broken explain error. That's because the percent %v specifier of fump.errorref retains nothing from the argument you pass to it except its string value. So we lose the identity and type of the error. This is a problem with Go errors, at least out of the box. The natural way to annotate for people will break programs. And here's where error wrapping comes to the rescue. We'll keep the original error when we create a new one. Then people can see the full error message and programs can inspect the separate errors. The first step is easy. Replace those percent %v's in fump.errorf with percent %w's. Percent %w will construct the same error string, but will retain the corresponding argument, wrapping it in the returned error. Unfortunately, explain error is still broken. It needs to unwrap the error it is given. It can do that with the errors.is and errors.as functions. Errors.is replaces equality checking. It checks for equality, but in a loop that follows the error chain. Errors.is also lets you replace calls to predicate functions with sentinel errors. Errors.as acts like a type assertion or switch, but also in a loop following the error chain. The pointer you pass to errors.as tells it the type you're looking for and also holds the value of that type if errors.as succeeds. That pointer argument can be confusing at first. We'll talk about it more later. Now that you've had a taste of it, let's dive into the details of error wrapping. At its heart is the unwrap method. It implements the error chain, 
by returning the next error in the linked list, or nil if you're at the end. Here we see the actual code for the OS package's path error type. Path error was wrapping errors before wrapping was a thing. It just did it by having an exported field called error. To fit into the Go113 wrapping framework, it now has an unwrap method that returns that field. The field no longer needs to be exported, and ideally it wouldn't be, but thanks to the Go1 compatibility promise, we can't unexport it. We now come to the first of three new functions in the errors package. Unwrap is just a convenience function that calls an errors unwrap method if it has one, and returns nil if it doesn't. Next up, errors is, which you've already met. It's meant to replace the common case of testing errors for equality. It walks the error chain, comparing each error it encounters with the error that the caller is looking for. If any of them are equal, it returns true. The third function, errors as, replaces type assertions and switches. It checks the type of each error in the chain until it finds a match. If it does find a match, it assigns it to target, its second argument. This function has caused a lot of confusion, so let's look at how you call it in more detail. At the top of the slide is a bit of the code from earlier, where we were looking for an os.path error. But let's be precise. What type exactly are we looking for? That is, what type implements Go's built-in error interface? The answer is pointer to os.pathError. That's what you'd use if you were doing a type assertion on error, as the second box here shows, and that's what the definition of path error says in the third box. The receiver of its error method is a pointer to a path error. So what do we pass to errors.as? We need to pass a pointer to a value of the error type. We need a pointer so errors.as can assign to it. Are we taking a pointer to a pointer? Yes. Is that a bad thing? In this case, no. It's the right thing. Think of it as a pointer to the error type. The last error wrapping feature is the percent %w verb of fump.errorf. When it sees a percent %w, fump.errorf returns an error value of some unexported type. That error value has the same message as it would have if you'd written percent %v or percent %s. It also wraps the error argument corresponding to the percent %w. Now let's talk about how you can incorporate wrapping into your programs and use it well. How should you start migrating your code to use wrapped errors? The first step is to be a good client. Start using errors is in place of equality checking and errors as in place of type assertions. But don't do it blindly. If you're calling a function that explicitly documents that it will return a particular error or type, and you're confident the author of that function will preserve compatibility, then you needn't make any changes to your current error handling. For example, if a standard library function says it returns io.eof, then the Go1 compatibility promise ensures that you can continue to check that with equality. When it comes to errors that your code returns, consider wrapping them to provide users and programs with more information. Just be careful not to break your clients. If you add wrapping where there was none before, then you may break clients who haven't switched to errors is and as. We saw that earlier with read config. It would certainly be wrong to do this if your documentation promised to return a particular error value or type. But even if your doc is silent about the sort of errors it returns, remember that callers who are eager for more information will try to pick apart returned errors by whatever means necessary, even matching strings if they have to. It's just that sort of shenanigans that motivates error wrapping in the first place. Any sort of change to a returned error can break those clients, so while you're within your rights to break them, tread carefully. One last point. Never wrap error values like io.eof, which don't really describe failures, but rather special conditions. There's no reason to add context to those. If you're already using fump.errorf with %v or %s to add context to an error, it's perfectly backwards compatible to switch to %w. You'll let programs get more information about the underlying error, without changing the text message at all. Clients that formerly had to resort to string matching can now use errors.is or as to get the same information in a much nicer way. But wrapping an error now can introduce compatibility problems in the future when you want to change your implementation. If you wrap an error, it is now part of your API because programs can depend on it. To see how that can be a problem in practice, let's return to our opening example. We changed our read config function to wrap the error we got from JSON decoding. That means that any error types and values returned by the encoding slash JSON package are now visible to our callers. What if later we wanted to switch to a different JSON package or to change formats entirely? 
Clients might depend on the particular wrapped errors we return, and a change could break them. How is that different from the case where a client looks for a string inside the error message? The difference is that we all understand that the text of error messages is for people and people only. It is emphatically not part of the API, like values and types are. To end this section, let me show you how to use errors in wrapping to replace or augment error codes. We've all seen numeric codes for errors, whether they're HTTP status codes, gRPC error codes, or your own set of values. They're a useful way to categorize errors, and you can send them back and forth over the wire. While writing package.go.dev, we found that using error values as a stand-in for codes helps with error handling. The error text isn't very informative on its own, but we always wrap it with additional context before returning it. Since it's wrapped, we can use errors is to check for it. We use a separate map to associate errors with codes where that makes sense. You could also define your own error type that includes both a message and a code. Now I'd like to talk about two features that were part of the original draft design on error inspection, but that were removed before Go113 was released. The two features are stack traces and error formatting. Let's start with stack traces. Now Go already gives you a stack trace when there's a panic. Here's a simple program along with the stack trace you get when you run it in the playground. The stack trace tells you the name, file, and line of each function on the stack when the panic happens. The line numbers are off here because the code I'm showing you is a condensed form of the actual program. Now stack traces are useful for debugging and it's reasonable to want a stack trace with errors as well as with panics. But stack traces have their problems. Although we didn't see this on the previous slide, a real stack trace is usually fairly long, with lots of helper functions that clutter the output without providing any useful information. At the same time, stack traces don't have enough information. They omit the values of arguments, which are often the keys you need to find the problem. In our example, we would love to see the arguments to understand how one of them got to be zero. Many Go error packages let you wrap an error with the stack trace at any point in the program. That's needed if you want to add a stack trace to an error chain that doesn't already have one. But the danger is that you can add a stack trace multiple times. The resulting output is redundant and confusing. Finally, stack traces don't play well with Go routines. If the error was generated in a Go routine, started from some point in the program, then the Go routine stack doesn't tell the whole story. You probably want to see the stack in the starting Go routine. That requires adding a stack trace to the error at the right point, which may not be easy. Nevertheless, we tried to add a stack trace to the error returned by errors.new. That way, many errors in existing Go code would instantly have a stack trace with no extra work. Wrapping stack traces by hand wouldn't need to happen nearly as often. It doesn't solve the other problems with stack traces, but we figured it was worth it and would make a lot of people happy. Unfortunately, it also made some people unhappy. After we added it, we got reports during testing that tools like the Go command were running significantly slower. The problem was all the global variables initialized with errors.new. Everyone needed a stack trace, and collecting a stack trace isn't cheap. The worst part is, all of those stack traces were useless. The program hadn't even started yet, so there was no stack to speak of. We considered optimizing for that case, but we were too close to the 113 release to make that happen. So we removed the feature. Perhaps someday we'll revisit it. But over at package.go.dev, we don't miss stack traces because we rolled our own better version. We build our own execution traces by hand. We don't do it for every function, so we eliminate stack trace clutter. And we can add any information we want, like function arguments. Now, if we added trace information at every return, it would be impossibly tedious. So we use a defer. We can then return the errors directly, and the defer wraps them. We have to name our return values to make this work. The defer checks if the error is not nil, and if it isn't, it wraps it with the function name and the interesting arguments. Now, even though there's only one defer per important function, this is still too verbose. So we broke out the body of that defer into its own function, which we call wrap. Wrap takes a pointer to an error along with printf style arguments. If the error isn't nil, wrap assigns a new wrapped error to it. You'll notice that wrap uses percent %w, so it always exposes the underlying error. We always do that because our errors are only for our own consumption. But you may also want to have on hand an alternative version of wrap that uses percent %v to avoid exposing implementation details to others, as we discussed earlier. 
So this is what our code actually looks like. At the cost of one line of code and named return values, we get our own custom stack traces complete with arguments. The second feature that didn't make it into Go113 was customized formatting for error messages. Remember I said that errors are for people and programs? Formatting was a feature for people, so large amounts of error information could be displayed in a more readable way. Here we see the way formatting normally works with wrapped errors. The results from calling the error method are concatenated together, separated by colons, on a single line. That's fine much of the time, but it doesn't work with errors that have a lot of information, like a stack trace, for example, or details about the piece of data that caused the error. We envisioned the ability to add that detail when printf's plus modifier was provided. Each error would contribute one or more lines to the result. Here, I've imagined that each error has information about the location where it occurred, and one of them has the line where the parse went bad. You can still see our implementation of this idea in the golang.org slash x slash x errors package. But in the end, we decided that the design was just too complicated to include in the standard library, and we couldn't find anything simpler that felt right. You can add detailed formatting to your own errors by writing a format method. Here's a sketch of the idea. It starts with an error type that has a message used for ordinary non-detailed output, another message for detailed output, and possibly a wrapped error. The unwrap method returns the wrapped error, and the error method concatenates the message with the wrapped errors message, which is what any error type that implements wrapping ought to do. The format method is treated specially by the printf functions of the fumped package. If your type has a format method with the signature shown here, then printf and friends will call it instead of what they usually do with the value. Our method treats percent plus v specially by printing the message and the detail string on separate lines. It then recursively calls format on the wrapped error if it can. With the properly constructed errors, this function produces the multi-line output we saw a couple of slides ago. I've omitted the spec function, which reconstructs the format specifier. That's unfortunately necessary, because the fump package doesn't provide support for recursive formatting. But you can find it and the rest of the code here in the repo listed on the next slide. Which brings me to the end of the talk. Here are links to the package documentation for errors and a blog post and a fact that we wrote. You can find the package.go.dev errors package I talked about in the package site repo. And lastly, there's a link to a repo of mine with the full formatting code I just showed you. Feel free to email me with any questions or comments at jba at google.com. Thank you very much.